A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Bismillahirrahmanirrahim I start in the name of Allah the Beneficent, the Merciful and I seek refuge from Shaitan the Accursed My dearest viewers, brothers and sisters from all over the world Assalamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh May the peace, blessings and the protection of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala be with you all Before going into the next episode where we'll be going more into the spiritual side as well as the physical side of the month of Ramadan we'll be giving you health tips as well as talking a little bit, little bit about how you can refine yourself spiritually I want to start off with a short saying from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says walking or going to the aid of another mu'min brother when you walk that distance is as though you're walking in between Safa and Marwa and that is the high station of being someone who is able to come to the aid of a fellow brother. Inshallah, you'll be able to join us today on the show by involving yourself via social media. So you can join us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and even YouTube once this video is uploaded onto there. In this episode, in this segment where we're looking at spiritual refinement, I want to focus upon a specific trait that has been mentioned in Dua Makarim al Akhlaq by Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, where he talks about Iman. Iman means faith. And he talks about how we can refine our faith and complete our faith essentially. And he talks about practical steps that we can take in order to make that happen. There's three main steps that he's highlighted so that we can accomplish this. The first one is to set a condition with yourself. The second one is to, once you've set this condition, is to assess your actions and to see if they've met the conditions that you've set. And thirdly, is to acknowledge that there's consequences to your actions. So if the action has been good, and if it's something that goes in accordance with what you've set out, then you can reward yourself. And if it's the other way around where you have defied what you've set out, then it is up to you to acknowledge that and to punish yourself. And you take full uh, responsibility of your actions. One specific way in which you can achieve this completion of Iman is to allow yourself to detach from this materialistic world, to detach yourself from your carnal desires, from this, this lowly dunya that we live in and when you do that you can focus in on the mission that you're trying to accomplish focus in upon your near in the holy quran in surah fajr allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna he's referring or he talks about the soul that is satisfied the soul that is at peace in some tafsir it is said that in, this is referring to imam al Hussein. Now, you have to think to yourself that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this, He's talking about a soul which is at peace, which is at such peace that it's achieved closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to think to ourselves, how can we achieve that level of peace, that level of satisfaction, so that we can also achieve that station? One of the ways that is highlighted that we can do this is to stop thinking about other people, stop thinking about other people's negatives and their, their, their downsides, stop judging other people. Because after all, you can only judge another person when you're perfect yourself. And we in our souls have so many imperfections that the first step towards achieving that satisfaction, that peace, is to start working on, on your own nafs, to start working on those aspects of your soul which need improvement. When we look at the Ahlul Bayt for inspiration, we see Sayyidah Fatima, alayha, 
And she has two laqab, two titles, which have been given to her, which are radhiya and mardiya, which literally translate as she is satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with her. And it just shows the station that she reached where it was complete perfection, complete peace and harmony with life. And that allowed her to attain that closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must follow that, that example that she set and use things that she did in her life, traits that she had in order to try and achieve that station. Another way we can practically try and achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which I've mentioned on a previous show is to try to stop complaining to count our blessings to look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and it is only when you do that you actually realize the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can only achieve satisfaction when you're happy with what you've got and when you're content with what's inside your heart and what's around you what Allah has given you and what mercies has bestowed upon you Achieving the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an integral part of spiritual growth and essentially it is part of a long spiritual journey that you are partaking in throughout the course of your life and that is your ultimate intention, your ultimate goal is to try and achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another example that we have from the Ahlul Bayt is Imam al Hussein alayhi salam where on the plains of Karbala he achieved the ultimate sacrifice and his only goal throughout this journey of his was to achieve the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why I mentioned earlier on that that particular ayah was revealed unto him and a lot of tafsir say that it is referring to Imam al-Hussein so the question is how can we also achieve that station I mean a lot of you will be watching this and thinking they are ma'asumeen we're not ma'asumeen. How can we practically take steps in order to achieve that closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can we achieve such a high station? And there are practical steps that you can take in order to achieve that closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll try and break some of these down so that you can follow them in your day-to-day -day life. And inshallah, by the end of the month of Ramadan, you will be a new person and inshallah, you will find yourself more spiritually elevated and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first of these is willpower so never give up always have the will to continue there are many times in your life where you will falter you will lapse and essentially the the intention that you have the goal that you have doesn't come to fruition and sometimes that is not through your own fault you try your best and you do things with the best of intentions but sometimes as human beings we're not perfect we have limitations we have weaknesses and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day does say that He will only test you to the boundaries of your, and your li the limits of what you can stretch to. So if you give your best shot and you cannot achieve what you set out to achieve, never lose hope, never give up. Because remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate giver and He's the ultimate guide. He will always guide you towards Him. Secondly, two very important things actually. The first one is Salah, never give up on your Salah, always pray on time and give importance to Salah because that is one of the ways in which you can achieve the ultimate closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is one of the few times in the day where you sit down in the presence of your Lord and you communicate with your Lord and also don't forget that the secrets of life and the mysteries of this universe, the secrets to your own destiny lie within the Holy Qur'an. Allah has promised, He said that He's mapped out everything in the universe within the Qur'an. But how many of us actually pick up the Qur'an and read it? Not only read it, but try to understand it, try and read the tafsir that comes with it. It is really important. Sometimes it is better to read one ayat of the Qur'an and to read it properly to understand the meanings and to read the tafsir rather than reading many, many pages. So sometimes just read one ayat and contemplate about it. Try and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you and what message is trying to send to you. Fasting. This month of Ramadan is a very, very special month. It's a month of blessings and it's a month in which you can achieve spiritual elevation. Use this month to your advantage and use it to constantly refine 
and to think about your iman, to think about your sincerity, and ultimately it will guide you towards completion of your faith. Essentially, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to come close to Him so that He can come closer to you. Because surely Allah, Allah has always said that, take one step towards me and I'll take 70 back towards you. So use this month of Ramadan in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And never ever forget the hereafter, never forget your own death. Because as I've said in a previous episode, it is only when you constantly think about your death, do you constantly think about your Lord. Because your Lord has said that every single soul will taste death and each and every one of us will go through that journey into the hereafter. So always remember that because at the end of the day, that is our eternal life and we hope that we can achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that in that eternal life we can be in, 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 the, in heaven and we can show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we achieve nearness to Him. And as I've said before, always aim or try and achieve closeness to the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. The reason being is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent representatives upon this earth Personalities and individuals who are there to guide us Personalities who are there to show us the traits that we need to instill within ourselves In order to attain closeness to the Almighty And what we have to do is look at the lives of these personalities From the Holy Prophet, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him To our 12th, 12th Imam And we can see during their lives they've been through so many different uh, different events they've seen so much during their lives and they've been tested in very different ways and we can all relate to, 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 to their lives in some way or another use their lives and allow that to guide you because if you do that that is the key to getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and finally never forget like I said at the beginning your niya, your intention is the most important thing if your niya is clean and if you're, if you're sincere and your intention is pure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate of guides. He will guide you towards Him. Remember that no matter what you do, Allah looks at your intention and He looks at how you use that intention, how you reassess that intention in order to get near to Him. So inshallah, let's pray that we can use this month in order to acquire these good traits, these positive traits, so that we can not only improve ourselves as human beings, but also attain the nearest nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali, commander of the faithful, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, The month of Ramadan has approached you. It is the chief of all months and the beginning of the year. In this episode, we're going to be looking around the world to see how people from all walks of life, from east to west, from all countries around the globe, prepare for their day-to-day -day lives in the month of Ramadan. Today, the country we're going to be looking at is the country of Morocco. Morocco is an Islamic country that lies in North Africa and borders the Mediterranean. The usual day-to-day -day working life when it's not Ramadan for people who are living there is that they start work bright and early at 8 in the morning and they break up for lunch at 12 and then they have something that's known as a siesta which is quite popular in the Mediterranean countries due to the hot weather where they break up from work from 12 till 2 and they, they have a, a short nap or a sleep and they have some lunch and after that they work from 2 until 6. In the month of Ramadan however the cycle of work changes so that they can adopt their lives to prepare and to make the most of the month of Ramadan. And the way in which, the way in which it changes is that their working day starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and ends at 2 and, and as a result they have a shorter working day. 
And after two o'clock they go home and they either rest or they prepare themselves um, by doing um, the praying the salah and doing a'mal if, if, if they wish so. And after that they go and the system that they use over there is that relatives invite one another to their house on a rota basis. So for example, if you have one family, they would invite the extended family to their house for food on the day that they are rota to cook. And this happens throughout the month of Ramadan and slowly the family members bond through this and also they can visit each other on a regular basis. After iftar time, the men of the family, they would usually go to the mosque to, in order to participate in the a'mal, in the salah. And as a result, there is a strong bond within the communities where brothers meet other brothers and they can talk about things, they can join together in the a'mal and pray together as one. Morocco isn't the only country that adopts this sort of, uh, this, this nature of preparing for the month of Ramadan and preparing day to day for the coming of Ramadan. The way in which other countries in North Africa and in other Muslim countries around that area, they prepare it's a similar sort of day-to-day uh, -day life. And in Morocco, the diet, because it's bordering the Mediterranean Sea, is what we call a typical Mediterranean diet, which is that they eat a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables, they have fresh fish which, is, uh, which comes from the sea and also they have tropical fruits or, or vegetables um, which grow from vines such as olives. Uh, as a result, the Moroccan diet and the Mediterranean diet actually as a whole is one of the healthiest diets that one can have. They break their fast or they open their fast on dates and milk. Milk, being a doctor, I know that milk is probably one of the best rehydration fluids that, the, that there is due to its um, dairy contact, due to its fat content. It stays in the stomach for a longer period of time and therefore the, the fluid in the milk actually dissipates into the body much slower so it keeps you rehydrated through the day. And also they eat a lot of lentils and soups which also helps them to stay rehydrated. As we will be progressing through this month and going through the shows, I shall be exploring more of the countries from around the world but it's been an interesting insight into the the way that the Moroccans have a unique and an adapted system which allows them to make the most this month. Finally as I request you every day from wherever you are around the world wherever you're watching the show from I would really like for you to send in your videos so that we can air those and show the world what it's like, how you prepare your day-to-day -day life for the month of Ramadan so that everyone else can see and we can share also the, the variety of ways in which people from around the world do prepare their day-to-day -day lives for the month of Ramadan. Imam Hussein TV viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you. Another souvenir in the holy city of Karbala are these different clothes. People here, after visiting the holy shrine of Imam Al Hussein and Abu Fadl Al Abbas, of course, take different types of souvenirs with them home. One of the souvenirs are these clothes that you can see behind me. These clothes are specified for uh, for hijab uh, people from iran from uh, different uh, countries uh, in the gulf like saudi arabia or emirate they come to the holy city of karbala they buy different types of cloth to make their own hijab
Yes, Imam Hussein TV viewers. I have one of the brothers. He's a store owner here in the holy city of Karbala. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Can you tell us about yourself and tell us about the people of the city of Karbala? Hassan Muhammad Hajj Ali from the city of Karbala. I have a place in the Imam Al-Sadiq, a place in the Al-Qmash, a place in the Imam Al-Rada, in the name of Imam Al-Rada. والحمد لله والشكر يعني إحنا بالنسبة يعني مو الاعتماد على الله ولكن الزوار زوار الإمام الحسين هم اللي يجون السوق من هذا السوق والزوار متواجدين دائما والسوق كلش زين وبالنسبة خوب بعد يعني دورات فطور يصير ما يصير فطور مو مشكلة تتبع حسب الزوار الإيرانيين اللي يجونا وبالنسبة لل يعني الأمان ناحية الأمان أمان كربلاء يعني ماكو كل المحافظات سوق الإمام الصادق يصير بين مقام الإمام المهدي والمقام مع الإمام جعفر الصادق فهذا السوق يعتبر سوق سنتر كربلاء أصبح لأنه كل زائرين كربلاء أو زائرين العتبات المقدسة أجانب إيرانيين خليجيين من كل المناطق تركمانستان أي دولة إسلامية يعني يجون زائر يجي إلى كربلاء لابد أن يجي لهذا السوق لأنه المقام مع الإمام جعفر الصادق بالنهاية والبداية مع المقام الإمام المهدي والسوق امان يعني الى ابعد الحدود، وبالنسبه كربلاء يعني اي زائر اللي يجي بيها اذا داخل المدينه امان وشوارع يعني الطرق الخارجيه امان الحمد لله والشكر، يعني القوات الامنيه ما مخليها شيء انه انه زائر يحس بخوف او شيء. والاهل السوق الحمد لله والشكر دائما يعني بخدمه الزوار احنا يعني مو بالنسبه مثلا انا كنا اصحاب المحلات يعني ما نقصر ويا الزائر اللي يجي واللي يروح والحمد لله والشكر يعني سوق زين. Uh, Brother Hassan is uh, congratulating you on the holy month of Ramadan and he is saying that uh, my story is between the holy uh, maqam of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq uh, he has a store here, he, he sells uh, different types of clothes here uh, he's saying that uh, different visitors from different countries from Iran, from other countries, from Armenia and other countries come to the holy city of Karbala and visit the Holy Shrine of Imam al-Hussein. They come here to uh, buy souvenirs for uh, to take back home with them. Regarding security, he's saying that the Holy City of Karbala is totally secure, and uh, all uh, the roads that leads to Holy City of Karbala, there are no problems with the roads, and the roads are open, uh, and uh, the stores are open uh, till late at night, and everyone can come and uh, to this uh, specific market and uh, take the souvenirs with them. today's episode regarding medical and health tips, we're going to be talking about hypertension. Hypertension, to those of you who are not from the medical field, is essentially high blood pressure. Now, blood pressure, high blood pressure can be a risk factor for um, uh, uh, heart disease, strokes. But before we talk about that, we're going to try and understand exactly what blood pressure is and why we try to control it. Blood pressure is simply the pressure that's produced when the blood is pumped out by the heart. The reason why you require a blood pressure is so that the blood can go around all the major organs in the body. The organs such as the brain, such as the kidneys, and even the heart itself requ requires blood to be transfused or transferred around the body, rather. If your blood pressure is too low, what happens is that the blood that is getting pumped out of the heart is not being pumped out with enough force to get to vital organs such as your brain. And some people with very low blood pressures can find that they get faint or they, get, they, they have syncope, they have faints. Uh, now, for them, it is important to stay rehydrated, but low blood pressure can also be a sign of good health as well. So, a lot of athletes tend to have low blood pressure because the amount of effort they need from the heart to get the blood into the vital organs such as the brain is much less and therefore their blood pressure naturally is a lot lower. So for them it's nothing to worry about. 
However, for the average person, for the lay person, it is very important to have a normal blood pressure. Now, in the medical field, day to day, I personally uh, look at lots and lots of people with blood pressures and some of them have high blood pressures, some of them have low blood pressures. Uh, the average blood pressure for any adult is 120 over 80, which is 120 is the top number and 80 is the bottom number. The reason why we have two numbers, because one is known as the systolic blood pressure, which is the pressure that you get when the blood is being actively pumped by the heart. And the other one is the diastolic pressure, which is the pressure that's produced when the heart is at rest. Now, why is it important to keep an eye on the blood pressure? Because when the blood pressure gets too high, so for example, if it gets over 140 over 90, so when you have those two numbers and the top number is 140 and the bottom number is 90, we as doctors get a little bit concerned. The reason being that studies have shown that a blood pressure above this level for most people, for the average person, is, can be a sign of long-term or can be the indication that there's long-term problems ahead. So uh, complications such as cardiovascular heart problems or strokes. The reason being that high blood pressure, when it gets too high, it can cause force on the lining of the blood vessels. So a lot of people who have high blood pressure can end up with strokes, for example, because what happens is when the blood is passing through at a high pressure, it causes pressure or causes force on the lining of the blood vessel and causes the formation of plaques. And plaques building up over time can block blood vessels and therefore causing strokes. Or if it's in the heart, the coronary vessels, it can cause heart attacks. The other complication of blood pressures, very, very high blood pressures, when you're talking about the systolic number being about 200, is it increases your risk of the blood vessels actually bursting. So a lot of people with very high blood pressures can actually have hemorrhages, which is uh, the blood vessels actually bursting and causing bleeds. So it's really, really important that if you have high blood pressure that you don't allow it to get too high because if you do, then it leaves you at risk of developing these long-term and short-term complications of high, of high blood pressure. My job here today is to try and give you tips and to give you advice uh, as a doctor and as a, as a medical practitioner on how I can help you and in order to give you tips to try and firstly assess whether you actually have a high blood pressure or not and secondly if you do what to do about it. The first thing to do is my advice to anyone whether you're young or old if you're fit or unfit is to invest in a blood pressure monitor and if you do that then it'd be wise to test your blood pressure at least once every six months in order to see if it's, if it's too high or if it's too low, if it's just about right. The reason being is that uh, bl high blood pressure is a often a silent uh, disease that a lot of people have that they don't know about it. And it's only when they coincidentally go to their doctors to have another problem checked, it is flagged up and they get treatments commenced for that. Once it has been identified that you do have high blood pressure, what are the different things you can do? Often the GPs or the doctors will give you a period of time in order to try and get the blood pressure down using your diet and exercise. So it is really important to cut things out in your diet such as salt and also other things that can increase your risk of heart disease such as sugars which can cause diabetes and foods that are high in cholesterol. The other thing you can do is, is exercise because exercise over a prolonged period of time has actually been shown to be beneficial in getting your blood pressure under control. However, if that is not possible, often what happens is that medications are commenced. Often the doctors will start you on a medication which will be given to you based on studies for your particular race or for your particular age group because the studies have shown slightly different outcomes with different age groups and with different races. I'm not going to go into that at the moment and I'm not going to go into specific medications at the moment as we don't have time but it's really important that once you start taking the medication that you monitor your blood pressure even more frequently so at least once a week or once every other week in order to see if the medication is effective. Your, your doctor will follow you up but it's important that you keep an eye on it yourself. Finally, I just want to elaborate a little bit uh, as to 
other things that you should look out for if you have high blood pressure. So signs of stroke and heart attacks are really important to be aware of for anyone in fact. Inshallah I will touch upon these, uh, these diseases, these problems in future shows but I think it is important for all people to be aware that high blood pressure is a risk factor for these conditions. Inshallah tomorrow we'll be looking more into potential causes of heart disease and other risk factors and how we as people, as individuals can limit those risk factors and how we can have a healthy lifestyle and improve the longevity and the quality of our life inshallah. Living in a diverse world today, one must know how to honor and treat one another despite the apparent differences we have in everything such as creed, color and belief because at the end of the day, we are all brothers and sisters in humanity. Nobody exemplified these beliefs better than the Ahlul Bayt and Prophet Muhammad wasallam, particularly in the treatment of the Jews and Christians. One day there was an elderly Christian man who had worked throughout his life but however he was not he was unable to save anything for his old age he has he had gone blind and for this reason he became a beggar on the streets of kufa one day Imam ali ibn abi talib the ruler of the muslim world back then was walking in the streets of kufa with his companions when he saw this man begging he turned to his companions with disgust and anger he said what is this we notice that Imam Ali Nabi Talib said, what is this and not who is this? Because he, th this kind of action in his ruling was unacceptable because he based his ruling on justice. Some of the people nearby ex explained the condition and the situation of that, uh, of that man and they said that he has no children to help him and he worked all his life but could not save anything for his old age. But they said, however, he's a Christian. Imam Ali Nabi Talib turned to them and said, so what? There's no difference in my ruling between Muslims and Christians. He said, how strange. While, while he was strong and could see, you took his labor from him. And now that he's no longer useful to you, you have abandoned him. It is upon the government and it is the responsibility of the government and the society to support him for the rest of his life. He turned to his companions and said, go and arrange for him a lifelong pension from the, state's, from the state's treasury. We wonder to see that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, a father, like, a father like Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he does this kind of action, we see on the day of Ashura, even non-Muslims fought alongside Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. And I would like to leave you with this quote by Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, where he says, there are two people in this world, either a brother to you in religion or a reflection to you in creation. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. this episode I wish to recite a nasheed which is very close to my heart it's called anything for you and it's related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it talks about a relationship between a servant and his Lord and how a servant would do anything for that Lord if there was a single sacred rose on a mountain top that grows where nobody ever dares to go for you i'd climb that mountain high i would reach out to that sky 
If that rose was your desire, don't you know that I would do anything, do anything for you, Allah, I would do anything, anything for you, for you. I'd sail the seven seas, walk the deserts in between, just to bring you anything you need. Nothing could ever be too much, anything to show my love. Cause it brings me strength enough Don't you know that I would do anything Do anything Do anything for you Allah I would do anything Anything for you Anything for you Allah Imam Ali, commander of the faithful, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, The month of Ramadan has approached you. It is the chief of all months and the beginning of the year. As we end this show, I want to leave you with a few words, a final thought, something that can challenge your philosophy as well and inshallah can get us talking and thinking in order to try and allow us to improve as human beings, to change our philosophies in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The final thought I want to leave you with today is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed all of, us, all of us, each and every one of us with the keys to our own destiny and those keys are with us from the moment we're born. These are the keys that will open up doors for us and will give us the secrets to this world and the hereafter. But the onus is upon us to find the door in which, to which this key will fit. Inshallah, I hope you think about that. And you can join in this debate on Twitter by using the hashtag IHTVRamadan. Because surely when we get talking, we can learn from each other. Inshallah, I want you to remember us all in your du'as and especially the most important du'a of all please remember and please pray for the reappearance of Imam al-Hujjah because only when he reappears will the religion of Islam prevail. Finally, I would welcome you to join me, your host Dr. Shabir Tijani again tomorrow for another episode of the Ramadan show. And please do not forget to join us on social media, on platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Inshallah, I look forward to seeing you all again very soon and inshallah we'll meet again. Wassalamu alaikum, jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.